All right, so welcome everyone. We are going to be covering Core Editor 101 type stuff. So just any anyone new to Core will find this useful. I'll kind of go over some basic tips and tricks when you're using Core to edit and make projects. And But first off, I'm going to kind of introduce the Mechverse Jam and talk about some assets that we have supplied you with for the art contest and the game contest. So yeah, if you have any any questions, feel free to let me know with the chat. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is for the art jam, we have a bunch of lore and stuff, so you can read through all these different categories, and there's also some more lore from this website. Um, I think this w uh, website is hosted on Mechaverse, so they do try to connect to your wallet, but you can sign in as a guest, and you can just have access to all this different lore. Uh, there's some e some other locations as well that are not included, but um, yeah, just note that these six locations are what we're looking for. But uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about, first off, is this stuff. So starting assets. So we have um, these uh, mecha uh, models that are available for you to use. And I, I think we suggest that you use them, but uh, they're not required, I'm pretty sure. So... Um, but they are a good tool, uh, definitely a good starting off point if you're interested in using them. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get into the core editor. I just realized my chat is hidden, but I will try to get back there. So if you're new to core, um, you'll probably be thrown into the core world. And then in order to get this menu, you just have to press escape on your keyboard. Uh, and then you'll see at the top here, we have different tabs. One of them is to create. This is where you can get into the editor. And uh, you'll probably not see any projects. These are all my projects that I've started. Um, if you just want to create a blank new one, you can get started by just clicking that button. And then you'll see all these different options you have. Um, empty project will start you off with uh, the bare minimals. Uh, but we have all these template or frameworks, uh, we call them. If you do want to start off with like a deathmatch game, so it's going to have like a kind of a basic level, but it's going to have all the game rules built into it. And same for all these different game types. So if you don't want to, you know, worry about the coding and stuff like that behind the game logic, this will kind of take care of it for you. Um, for this demonstration, I'm going to be using the actual assets. So in order to find the assets, um, one of the sub tabs that you'll see. Uh, my projects, new project, and then the third sub tab is going to be where you can find the mecha assets. So, uh, community projects are projects that are kind of open to the public to use. So, some people have like added uh, entire obbies. Um, we have some of the core projects as well, core royale. So, uh, kind of the whole uh, game is uh, within this project, so you can kind of get a sense of what a complete game looks like if you're interested. Uh, but to find the Mechaverse assets, you're going to type in Mecha. And you should probably find it pretty quickly because there's nothing else really with the Mechaverse name on it. So Mechaverse Jam Art Assets. So this is the first installment of framework we're adding. Uh, we will have another one in a week. December 6th, we're going to have another one with actual wearable uh, Mechas. So I'll jump into this one. So you just click on it, and then you can give it a name, and now it's essentially your own project. And uh, you'll see what I mean in a sec. So boom, we're in the core editor, and here we go. We have our our Mechaverse assets. So uh, let me reposition this so I can see the chat. That way I don't miss any questions. So <clears throat> uh, first things first, what we're going to do is let's talk about the windows. So when you jump into the core editor th for the first time, um, you're going to have uh, a series of windows that make up the core editor. So the first one where you can see the actual project, this is called the viewport uh, window. And if you're wondering how do I get any window, like you don't see some windows, you can always click at the top here, window, and it has a list of all the different windows. And you can also reset view to default if you ever kind of like delete all your windows on accident and this will kind of reset your layout um, to basically what this is. So the viewport is where you can see the actual project and you can fly around um, by using the right mouse button. You hold it down and you can kind of move around the mouse to rotate 
and then you can use WASD to move around as if you're flying. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the Megaverse assets. So you can see we have four different types, uh, one for each uh, faction. Um, so you can see the different, uh, the way they're built up. If you click on it, it'll kind of, in the hierarchy, it'll uh, click on that specific um, piece of the armor you just clicked on. Um, if you wanted to get the group though, because what these are is a group of objects put together. Um, like this tiny little component is part of the entire uh, big robot. So if you wanted to click on the entire group though, you can either click on it through the hierarchy. You can see that it's like a parenting system. So this little part is a child. It's kind of indented in the hierarchy. So the hierarchy is a list of all the different objects in your game. Um, so when I clicked on it, it kind of highlighted it over here. So you can see it's it kind of indented. So it's a group uh, called left hip. So this whole left hip is the left leg. And um, a cool thing you can do is you can hide uh, an object or a group by just clicking this little eyeball. You can see the entire left leg is disappearing when I do that. It's not deleting it. It's just hiding it from the viewport. And when you play your game, you're still going to see that left leg. It's just for editing purposes. Um, another cool thing is there's this lock here. So if I click the lock, now if I were to uh, try to select any part of the left leg, it is not going to be able to select it. It's going to click through and get the floor instead. So uh, another cool thing that uh, you can uh, use while editing. So the left lock is a, it's good for like terrain as well. If you have like a, a big world and you have like grass everywhere, you don't want to click on the grass. So you can always lock the terrain and you won't have to worry about clicking on it on accident. Um, so that's useful. Um, but uh, another cool thing is if I wanted to click on like the arm, but for now it's like clicking on the specific part like this wrist you can actually change your selecting mode at the top left here or you can press c and you can say toggle the group instead of just the object so instead of clicking just the object it should try to get the nearest group or the the most parent group so you can see it clicked the entire thing the entire og uh, mecha is highlighted instead of just the wrist component or you know the finger component so uh this can be useful um just note that it is going to get the most, uh, it's going to get the eldest parent and not like just the left leg. So you kind of have to structure your, if you are kit bashing, uh, which I'm not going to get too into, uh, you might want to use folders instead of groups uh, for, her, you know, setting up your, your, your grouping. That way you, maybe you just want to select one part of the arm instead of selecting the entire thing. So um, okay, so yeah, that's selecting uh, the different ways you can select. Um, another uh, useful thing is moving the object that you have selected around. So when you select something, you'll get these widgets at the at the origin point. Um, and you can move them around by just dragging these arrows. So these represent different axes. So uh, if you're wondering, like, if you're familiar with uh, 3D... Uh, world coordinates, you'll know that there's X, Y, and Z. And if you're wondering which one's which, at the bottom left here, there's a little tiny widget that kind of explains the colors and uh, the direction. So X is red, Y is green, and Z is blue. So this is good to know in case you ever want to move stuff around using the properties. So the properties, uh, when you have something selected, uh, the properties window uh, at the bottom right here has different information about like where this object's at, how it's rotated, and uh, if it's visible or not. So there's a lot of different types of properties that you can change about the object. Um, and you can also see X, Y, and Z are color coordinated. So that's how you kind of know what they represent as well. X is always red, Y is always blue, or green, and Z is always blue. So uh, yeah, if you wanted to move it up, you just change to Z. You can drag that blue arrow. You could change the number here uh in the properties uh text box you can also drag the so a cool thing that i didn't know for a while is that you can drag the number from the properties so if you put your mouse next to the left edge of the number box you can actually 
uh, tween it, I think we call it, or I'm not sure what we call it, but I call it tweening, uh, and where you just click the left edge of the number box, and then you move your mouse left and right, and it kind of uh, changes the number, makes it bigger or left or uh, smaller based on the direction you move your mouse. So that's a cool little thing you can do. Uh, you can always revert it to default if you want it to be 0, 0, 0. You can see it kind of went to the center of the world there. Um, and if you, let's say, for instance, I don't want, the, I want the robot to go back to where it used to be. Uh, you could do control Z to kind of undo actions one by one, or you could go to the history and you can kind of get a full list of the entire history of what you've been doing. Um, so I can actually go back to the beginning of the project by just clicking the most, uh, the, the newest, uh, action I did. So now I'm back to when I first clicked on the Mecca. Um, all right. So the, oh yeah, I didn't talk about the, the assets uh, coming out. So December 6, uh, not January 6, but those are going to be, uh, yeah, rigged so that they can be, um, equipped by the player. Correct. So, uh, you're going to be able to, so if I press play at the top here, I can, I can see the art assets and stuff like that, but for now, they're just art assets. They, they can't be interacted with. I can't wear them. I can't, um, you know, um, become a mecha. Uh, on December 6th, they're going to be rigged so that when you approach, you can equip it. And then you, when the player moves, the mecha is basically the player now. So you can see that. Um, the all the different joints will be connected to the right places. So uh, that's coming in a week. Next Tuesday, I believe, is December 6th. So, yep, look out for that if you're interested in making a game with uh, the mechas. But for art assets, you don't really have to worry about that. Um, you can just use this as it is. Um, you don't really have to do any interactive stuff for the, the art jam. Uh, yes, they are the same models, though. Uh, just rereading your question, Roboto Man. They're just going to be equipable, essentially. Um, cool. So, where was I? So, we were talking about transforming objects, like moving them. So, if I click on the robot, I can move using the arrows. There's also uh, some more uh, widgets on the screen. So, you can see there's, like, these squares. This allows you to move it in two dimensions. So, if you wanted it to kind of, like... You, you just wanted to move it, you know, uh, flat against the the green arrow. So it, it's useful in some cases when you're, like, moving a painting on a wall. You don't want the painting to be moving off the wall. Um, that's the best uh, example I can think of. Uh, and there's also this new stuff that we've added where you can kind of move it in uh, all three dimensions at the same time. Uh, can get a little confusing, but can be useful. Um, if you just want to quickly move something in the world, but you're not sure what direction you need to move it in. So you just click that little white ball at the, at the center here. Um, let's see. Another cool thing that, uh, there's a lot of keyboard shortcuts that I'm going to be mentioning. And if you're interested in finding these, um, there is, if you go to the core docs, um, there is a useful... I think it's in the core. Oh, no, it's one of these references. Editor shortcuts. That's what it is. So um, I'll just include a link here, but you can find it in the core editor. Um, so this is a list of all the different shortcuts that you can use. So if you're ever wondering, like, what was I doing? Like, how did I move around in the editor? You can just find it. Move in editor. I'm holding the right mouse button down. So uh useful to keep in mind if you're not familiar with any of the core editor shortcuts but there's also some really niche uh, niche ones uh one of my favorites is the end key which who knows when i i don't think i've ever used the end key uh, outside of core but if you press the end key it will try to place a object flat on the ground um doesn't work all the time if it's a weird model but uh, you can see, for instance, this one, like, place it, uh, place, like, the, uh, what's it called? The, um, I forget what we're calling that. Uh, it's like the platform. That's what it is. So the platform is flat on the ground now. Uh, it used to be up in the air, you know, it was kind of weird, but I pressed N key, and now it's flat on the ground. So it could be useful if you are trying to place something on the ground. Um, 
All right, so that's moving stuff around. I think that's about covers it. If you want to rotate something, you can uh, change to rotation mode. Um, so there's there's four different modes now. Uh, we just added a fourth one, which is uh, kind of scaling, uh, but more advanced. Um, the second mode is called rotation. You can switch to it by just pressing E. And if you want to switch it back, you can see the widgets change to be a circle now. If you want to change back to moving, you can press W or just press this button at the top here. Um, so E is rotating. It kind of has the same same dif uh, three different axes. Um, and it also has this new axis, um, which is kind of like a multi um, axes. It moves it around in multiple axes at the same time. It can be very confusing to use again, but um, can be useful if you're trying to like spin a ball around, but you're not sure which direction to move it. Um, so, yep, that is uh, the different axes that you can move it. You can also use the properties over here if you're not sure which direction to move it. And uh, you may have noticed that it's kind of snapping. It's not like smoothly rotating. And that's because I have snapping mode on. So uh, I'm going to talk about that now. So snap to grid is uh, used in all of these different uh, tra uh, transforming modes. So uh, essentially what it does, when I was moving, I was actually snapping. So I was moving by 25 units every time. Uh, if I didn't want to do that, if I wanted to like be kind of moving... Uh, just uh, smoothly. I, I'm not sure like exactly what unit I need to be moving, but I, maybe I want to get like an in between these two steps. Um, I can turn snapping off by just clicking on this snap to grid, or I can press G, and now I can like smoothly be moving and I can get that exact position I need. So uh, it can be quite useful to turn off snapping, but if you do want to have like something 25 exactly to the right. Um, it is good to use snapping and there's some some good uh, use cases as well when you're using like tile sets uh, which I might get into all right and then um, if you so rotating if you want to rotate it without snapping you can see you can get that exact position or angle um, scaling as uh, kind of the same idea it's useful for uh, making stuff get bigger or smaller um, just note that if I'm selecting multiple things, like I'm selecting a bunch of different objects, it's not going to let me scale in one axis. So, um, the reason for that is that it's, it's like a combination of all these different objects and we try to preserve the, the, uh, like, um, the the entire shape of this object is like put together specifically so we try to preserve that when we're scaling so when you're selecting multiple objects you're not going to be able to kind of change the axes of just one but you can change the axes of all of them when you're scaling something so it's going to kind of make it grow together that way you can see the the model doesn't like separate at the hip or at the leg so uh, you won't get any weird uh, scaling issues when you make it bigger or smaller um, but if we were to just select like the ground, for instance, I can make it, you know, smaller in just one direction. So just take note of that. Um, let's see, another scaling uh, tip is that this new mode box, which is really useful, um, because when you were scaling before, and I want to like, maybe I want to get it a little bit uh, thinner um, in one direction. Uh, you can see that it's getting bigger and smaller uh, based on the center of this object. Like the, the sides are coming in together. So let's say I only wanted one side to come in, not both of them. Uh, box mode uh, by pressing R will allow you to just bring in one side instead of it being kind of both both sides moving in. So you can see it has handles on both sides of, of this circle platform so that can be extremely useful when you're trying to just bring in like a side of a wall or um, you know fit a door into a doorway uh, you don't have to worry about the center of the door uh, yeah so that about covers all the transformation tools yes proportion that's what I was trying to say yeah you're trying to preserve the proportion of the the mecha when you're scaling it so that's why uh, it won't allow you to kind of do that uh, one axis scaling. Yeah, thank you for that.
All right, uh, let's see. I think I just about covered the viewport transforming objects. Um, let's see. Oh, world space. Yeah, I didn't really cover that. So let's cover that for a quick sec. So when you're, maybe you rotated the, the mecha in this direction. And now I can, maybe I just want to move it forward. I want to move it in like, you know, it's, uh, so it's looking this way. So now I just want to move it like 10 steps in front of where it's looking. If I were to try to move it, uh, you can see these arrows are still using like the world forward. So the, the red, uh, the red uh, X is not like rotating with the, with the mecha, uh, it's not pointing in that direction. Um, so it's not, you know, it's gonna be kind of hard. I'm gonna have to kind of move it in two axes. I can't just move it in one axis, but uh, there is a way to do that by using its local uh, direction. So right now I'm using the world direction, which is kind of like a compass. It's like true north is always that way. That's why the red arrow will always point that way in world axes. But you can change it to local space by pressing T or just pressing local. And now when I did that, you can see that the red arrow is pointing in the direction the Mecca is facing. So it allows you to easily move it in that direction. So um, can be quite useful when you're dealing with uh, rotated objects. So something to keep in mind, uh, world space versus local space. All right, I think that just about covers moving stuff and rotating stuff. So. Let's uh, let's move on to some other windows. So I covered the hierarchy, just a list of all the different objects. Um, you can collapse um, children. So when I clicked on the wrist, it kind of found that specific object. And you can see these are all kind of grouped together. So you can kind of hide the children of, an, of a parent by just clicking this little arrow here. And it, it, when you're dealing with like something that's nested, that's a, a term used when there's like a bunch of children within children so there's like you know an ancestor that you know can get kind of messy and you're trying to find something maybe you're trying to find you know uh just like the the starting world uh like the terrain for example uh you're gonna have to scroll through if it's like you know a bunch of different children are open a uh, quick way to do uh hiding all the children is just click in this collapse all and you can see it just kind of uh folded all the folders so now it's all nice and clean um so that that can be useful uh you can also filter for certain objects so let's say i just wanted to find the uh i don't know the og mecca so if i type og at the top here it will look for names that include the name og in it uh it'll also find you know og in other ways like toggle <laughs> for example so uh just take note of that uh, you can also filter for specific objects such as just um Maybe you just want to find a group or a folder with the name OG, uh, which does not exist. So, um, yeah, that's the filtering for searching. And we also have scenes here. Um, maybe I can jump into that real quick. So uh, scenes are basically you can, so this project can be split up into different uh, scenes. Um, so what that means, if I wanted to, maybe I wanted like a level one for like a tutorial and then I wanted a an actual level one. Uh, so after the tutorial, they kind of, you know, jump into a new world. Uh, you can create different scenes for that. So it's essentially multiple projects within one. Um, so you can just uh, go to the scenes window, create a new scene, give it a name, you know, level two. And when you create it, it's going to ask if you want to load into it. It's going to say you're going to need to save your current scene. And then, boom, you kind of restarted the entire project into a new scene. Um, the other project is still there. Uh, it's just within the, the previous scene you're in. So uh, you just click on it from the scenes window to go back to any other scene. And, boom, it's still there. Um, so you can see the hierarchy is also kind of wiping out. So anything from that previous scene, you can't. You, you won't be able to see it in the hierarchy. It's kind of just only stuff within the current scene you're in. Um, and there's different ways to hop between scenes, uh, like within the actual live game. Um, so I'll maybe I'll mention that briefly. So let's jump into um, core content. So uh, now I'm going to kind of talk about uh, a general thing within core itself. Um, so when you install core, 
you're actually downloading a, a big library of assets that we have, like a cube, um, a cylinder, uh, a tree. So we have a we have a huge library full of all these different 3D models. And uh, the, uh, the reason you do that is when you're hopping between, you know, uh, my project or maybe someone else's project, uh, you don't have to reinstall all the objects within my game because we're all using the same, uh, you can think of it like a big toy chest of objects that you can grab from. So we're all using the same objects from that toy chest. Um, you can manipulate those objects in different ways and that's how you can, get, you know, kind of get uh, unique things. But um the the bad thing about that though is that we don't allow you to import um 3d models from outside of core so if you made this really cool thing in blender like a big dragon in blender uh, there's no way for you to like import a 3d model so that's one downside of it um but the the big upside is that there's little to no load time when you're hopping between uh, one project and another project uh, because we know all the assets that are included. We know the definition. Uh, it's just how did you manipulate it? You know, how did you change the size? Where did you position that object? So, um, yeah, core content is uh, the list of all the different uh, library assets that you've added to your game. So if I wanted to add a cube to my game, I would go to core content. I would uh, search for cube. Or you could find it through the different categories of objects. Um, so one thing, if you're new to core, I would highly uh, suggest when you're first starting is to kind of just explore the core content. Go through the different categories. You know, what's in nature? Oh, it's all these different bushes and trees and rocks and stuff like that. Um, so just, you know, peruse around. Um, there's subcategories within subcategories. So there's, there's a ton of stuff. Um, I've definitely not you know, seeing every object because, you know, there's thousands and thousands, but uh, you'll, you'll be surprised at what you can find here. So uh, I just want a cube. There's all these different types of cubes. Um, a really cool type of cube is called bottom aligned. Um, what that means is that the origin, so the widgets are all at the bottom. And when you place it in the world, it's going to be kind of flat against the ground. And this is useful when you're, you know, just trying to place something on, you know, on a ground world. Uh, if you do a regular cube, you'll see that the middle is kind of being placed on the ground, uh, which is not useful because now the bottom half of the cube is on the ground. Uh, you can use the end key trick to kind of flatten it, but um, I personally find the bottom align cube a little bit easier to just kind of drag and drop in. Um, yeah, so there's all these basic shapes, um, and you can, you can use these to kitbash, uh, you know, more complex models. You can also use different types of, um, you don't have to use basic shapes all the time. Maybe you, you want to use a tree part of a model. You want to make like a tree monster. So you can, you can start with that nature category and find a tree and then go from there. And then maybe you, you want to use, um, you know, like a trunk or something. So you can combine different objects together and get um, get that specific shape you're looking for instead of just using basic shapes. So uh, I'm not going to go too into kit bashing as I keep mentioning because I'm not a good kit basher. So <laughs> I don't want to embarrass myself. Um, but just for a quick example, let's say, let's just say that this is my, uh, I'm going to make like a tree monster, for example. So we'll pretend these are arms or something. Um, so a cool thing that you can do is you can actually uh, mirror an object. So I just created uh, one arm of my tree monster and I want to make the other arm. So what I did, uh, I kind of did that really quickly, but with the one tree selected, I can press control W and it will duplicate it. So now I have two different trees. Can't really see it because they're overlapping, um, but uh, there's two trees in there and I want to mirror it to the other side. So what I can do is I can right click on the scene and there's these options for mirroring and you can say mirror in the world space Y axis. So I want it to be mirrored across the red arrow. So I'm going to use red is X. So I'm going to mirror it against the world space X axis. Did that work? Oh, maybe, 
Okay, you know what it did? It mirrored it the wrong way. I want it to mirror against the green axis, so it's on the inverted green arrow on the other side. So I'm going to redo that for Y. There we go. And you can see the... It doesn't really work because the, the tree is kind of in the middle of the cube, but you get the idea. It kind of just flipped the tree uh, against the, the green arrow. So that's always useful. Um, I feel like I need one more thing for the head of my monster. Ooh, that is way too big. Uh, let's see. I'll just do like a rock or something. There we go. All right. So now I made this cool looking tree monster. Um, using all these different objects from from the core content window, just dragging them in. So let's say I'm happy with this, and I kind of want to save like this group of objects, right? Because maybe I'm gonna spawn them in later, or maybe I'm going to create an army of tree folk. So what I want to do is I want to select all the different shapes that made up this tree monster, and I want to group them together. So uh, the way you can do that is in the hierarchy, you can uh, click on one of them in. Uh, this is the first object I added in the cube and then all the ones below it are part of it So I'm going to hold shift and click on the bottom one so you can see it selected all of them at the same time You can also hold control and just click Each of them uh, individually you can also click from within the scene if that is easier for you So I'm holding control while I'm clicking them all and now they're all selected and then uh, what you want to do is you want to do control G or you could right click over here and a uh, new group containing these. So what I've done now is I have kind of grouped all these objects together into a parent. So now I could name this group uh, tree monster. So if I want to move the, the tree monster together, I just click on the group and then I can kind of move that around. Um, so that's useful to group it. Um, but let's say I wanted to create multiple of them. Um, I could just control copy. But the problem with this is that, so now I have two different tree monsters. But if I change, uh, let's say I wanted to change the cube. I don't like the cube. I want like a tree trunk instead of a cube. Um, if I change this one only. So if I change like, if I delete the cube, for instance, only this one will change. The other one, the duplicated one, will not change. So if you wanted to kind of uh, have a definition of what a tree monster is and then have that be uh, kind of mimicked across all instances of tree monsters, you're going to want to use templates for this. So when you have a group, you're going to want to save this definition of what a tree monster is by right-clicking it and creating a new template from this object. So what this does is now it has a saved definition of all these group objects together. And you'll see that when I did that, the project content window popped up. So the project content is a list of all the different uh, stuff that I've created. Uh, it has all the different stuff for the... Um, so there's all these templates for like the mecha uh, inside of this project. So this is quite useful as well. If you ever wanted to bring this outside of your project, you can actually right click and export. Um, so if you wanted to, you know, you just wanted the Mecha assets, you could come into this project, this shared project, you could right click uh, export on the template, and then you can just uh, import it by dragging it into a different project. Um, so I can go into that later if you guys are interested. Um, but for now, uh, I've created a template and I see, it was there a question? Why is it better to put your objects into a group instead of a file when you said it would be useful to put groups into a file? Oh, the folder. Yeah, so folder versus groups. So good question. Um, it is useful sometimes to use folders because when you're selecting something, um, it will get the most parent um, group. Uh, but if these were, in, if let's say, for instance, um, just copy these over here. So let's say I just created a duplicate, but let's say I put these inside of a folder, new folder containing these. So the same, same thing has happened, uh, but when I click on it, it's not going to do that selecting as a group thing. So what I was saying is uh, if you wanted to, you know, use that uh, selecting a, selecting the group selection mode, um, this won't work for folders. 
They, they are not treated as groups. So a group um, is useful when you want to kind of group together objects. A folder is useful when you want to make a new directory in your project. So a directory um, is what is kind of like, um, if you look at the project uh, data, um, it's actually creating a folder, like, you know, like the Windows folder. So this is actually creating a folder within your core project when you create a new folder. So this is good for separating, uh, uh, when you're working in groups, it's good to use folders for that. That way you're not, uh, you know, changing someone else's project uh, content. Uh, you can use, you know, my folder, Aaron folder. So it's good for that. It's also good for like separating different, um, different portions of your project, like all the game settings by default are placed into a folder. So that's always good to separate it from the other stuff. Um, so I was mentioning folders for kit bashing because if you wanted to maybe have a folder for uh, the entire tree monster, but you wanted groups for maybe I had like a bunch of stuff for my left arm and right arm. Uh, instead of clicking, when I click on the arm, instead of clicking the, on the entire thing, if this entire thing was a folder instead, it wouldn't be able to uh, select the entire thing. It would just click on the group of the arm because that is the, the only group that it recognizes. The entire tree monster could be a folder instead. So that, that could be one workaround if you wanted the group selection mode. Um, I hope that answers your question, but yeah. Um, uh, the the real reason is when you're selecting a thing, you don't want it to be. Uh, uh, sometimes you don't want it to be sl uh, actually selecting the entire thing. You just want to have groups for each uh, limb, for example. Um, that way, when I click on the left arm, it selects the left arm instead of the entire thing. So that'd be a good use case for using folders. And I don't believe you can actually. Let me try something. Um, Oh, you can. You can create a new template from a folder. So uh, that's not a problem. Uh, or collaborate with others. Yes, uh, that is a great point. Um, not going to get into that right now, but using folders for different people's, uh, like adding a folder at the top here is going to be useful when you don't want to merge conflict. You don't want to have like, you know, one change that I did conflict with another change someone else did. Um, when you start dealing with GitHub, folders are going to be your best friend. Like I will only work inside my folder. You will only work inside your folder and nothing will ever conflict. Uh, groups will not uh, solve that problem because they are not treated as folders. So anything I do to this tree monster and anything you do to this floor, they're going to conflict if I do one change. Um, so that's a whole different thing. I'm not going to get into it, but yep. Um, folders can be quite useful for, for group management. Um, all right. So yeah, I created a template of the tree monster. So it's kind of a safe definition of this group and I can just drag it in from project content. And now I have, you know, another tree monster. And the cool thing about templates is that if I were to change this, um, let's say I wanted to change the body uh, to be a tree trunk, I could go to here. If I press delete, it's going to say I need a de instance this template. So what de instance means is that it's no longer going to be using the the saved version definition of the object. So when you start like changing. Uh, the amount of objects, or if you try, like I can move this around. That's fine uh, without de-instancing. But once I try to delete an object, it's going to say I need a de-instance. So I'm, I'm no longer, uh, so you see it change color as well. Uh, I'm no longer using this definition of a tree monster. I'm kind of going down a different path. It still has the saved version um in its memory it's like oh you used to be a tree monster but you're no longer you're going down a different path now but let's say i want this path to be the save definition so now i want every instance to be kind of saved to what this version is so what i can do is i can right click this tree monster and i can say update the template from this object so when i do that now all my templates are using the version of this object uh, so now it is using the version you can see it changed back to that color so um, you can also do the opposite. So let's say I, I didn't want, I d no longer want this 
a group of objects to be using the definition. I kind of just, uh, you know, I changed my mind. I want it to be something else. So I can actually abandon the template from this uh, instance. So now it turned all white. It is no longer saving. There's no longer any memory of it being a template. So yeah, you're not you're not going to have any of that like you know update template from object type thing anymore. So it, it could be its own thing now. So yep, uh, templates are extremely useful when you're trying to you know create. Uh, it can be even useful for like uh, let's say you're making a, a house with a fence, and you need to have like a fence that you know is repeated. Um, useful for all types of stuff when you're kit bashing. So. Uh, if you needed to update the fence, just one post, and you wanted it to kind of save for all the other posts, you would just update th the template for that fence post. Um, so, yeah, a lot of good use cases. Also useful for coding if you want to spawn something in. Um, you can only spawn in a template. Um, so you're going to want to create a template first before you try to spawn anything in. All right, so... I think I'm going to move on from templates now. Uh, there will be a, a kit bashing workshop, so don't want to take away from that. Um, let's jump into some general knowledge. So uh, when you're creating worlds, you can create a new terrain. So terrains are a special type of object. Um, so you can, uh, you can create a terrain at the top here. I kind of... Uh, flew through that. So terrain creator, generate new terrain. Um, it will give you this window pop-up where you can select a different type of terrain that's pre-built, or you could just go with a flat terrain if you want to kind of uh, mold it yourself. Um, so I'm just going to do like a rolling hills. There's all these different properties for how big it is and the, the size of the hills and like the noise of the hills, how how random it is. So I'm just going to generate the, the pre-built stuff. And you can see it just, you know, creates these rolling hills uh, right away. So terrains are really cool when you want to create like mountains and uh, or create uh, a vast um, ground for the player to walk in. Uh, the cool thing about it is that the properties window of your terrain has all these different tools for sculpting it. So these are, this is like a voxel editor now. So I can, you know, make hills and stuff like that by just clicking. You'll see there's like a paintbrush and you can also do the opposite destruct. You can go make a, make a cave or whatever you want. And then you can also smooth it out. There's all these different options. So I'm not going to get too into it because we're going to have a environment workshop where we're going to, talk about terrain uh, but just know that there's a whole bunch of different stuff you can even paint it so if you want the entire thing to be grass you just have to add paint and then you can edit the material so you can add like instead of grass being the default it could be a, a sand terrain and you can make like sand dunes and stuff like that or even bricks why not create that whatever world you're, you're aiming for so you could you know office carpet whatever I can't imagine the rug burn from all this, but uh, yep, that's terrain. Uh, there's foliage if you want to add like um, trees everywhere or whatever type of objects. So now you can see all their, these neon signs being painted on, kind of a, a weird uh, foliage to have, but really useful for just adding grass randomly or trees to your terrain. Uh, but yeah, you can use any object as foliage, anything inside of core content. Um, all right, so that's terrain. I'm going to delete it. Uh, let's see, what else? We talked about core content. Uh, let's talk about community content real quick. So uh, community content is templates that other creators have published for other people to use. So it can be a model. It could be a game component. So you can see the most popular one is NPC AI Kit. Uh, this has like a fully functioning system of NPCs. You can edit it to create your own NPCs. So it has all the logic, has some models for uh, basic NPCs spawning and attacking the player and stuff like that. So uh, it can be almost anything. You can see there's a rocky forest. So this has like a bunch of trees and rocks and caves and stuff like that. So um, yeah, there's all different types of stuff in here. So if you're if you're trying to find something like, let's say I want like an eagle uh, this might be a bad example. Oh yeah, Desert Eagle. There you go. But there's also this, you know, basic eagle costume that someone has kit bashed together. 
Uh, pulse rifle. All right, let's check it out. Is this a uh, self promotion? I'm guessing. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So uh, it. Oh, I spelled pulse wrong. Um, the one bad thing about community content is that the search system is abysmal. Um, you can see I type pulse rifle and this doesn't even have pulse rifle in it. It's the FPS rifle. So, uh, sometimes you're going to have to play around with the, the search settings. Uh, one of the, the best ways is to actually search for the, the person you're thinking of. Uh, I forget, is this your actual, so like if I want to find cyborg stuff, if I search for cyborg prime, ah, there it is. So, uh, searching the actual user is sometimes quicker than searching the actual object because uh, you'll there's all these different tags that uh, that people could have um, or maybe no tags at all so that doesn't help sometimes but uh, yeah if you uh, wanted to let's say I found cyborgs pulse rifle and I want to bring that into my game I can click import now it is going to save it to the core content so you'll see that it's uh, in the core content, but it's not anywhere in my project yet. So I have to actually drag it into the project from core content, similar to like a cube or whatever. So now I have this pulse rifle. Now when I press play, I can pick it up, I can shoot it. So it's fully functioning straight from community content. Thanks to Cyborg, my buddy here. So yep. Uh, when I drag it in uh, from the core content, it actually saves that template that um, cyborg created to project content. So you can see at the bottom here, there's like an imported content section and it, here's the actual template, uh, that is now inside my project. And, uh, it's also inside the hierarchy right here as well. So, yep. Um, you may be wondering how did he create a weapon? Like, was it like, you know, a ton of coding he had to do? And the answer is probably no. Uh, what he did, is, what I'm guessing he did, is that he, from core content, we don't just have 3D objects. We also have game objects, um, such as fully functioning advanced assault rifle. So, you know, he probably used this, uh, you know, rifle as a starting off point. He probably just changed the look of it and maybe played around with some settings. So, um yeah, I, di I didn't really get to it, but we have a whole variety of different core uh, core content. We have like fully functioning vehicles that you can just drag in and actually just jump into. So if I were to play my game, I can jump into this taxi and drive around in it and stuff like that. So cool stuff inside of core content. Um, another thing uh, worth mentioning is that audio is another thing that uh, we don't allow you to import. So you can't just like, you know, download a song and then import it into core content. Uh, we have a vast library of different, you know, music and audio uh, clips. So uh, similar to 3D objects, you kind of have to use our, our audio um, when you're doing that. One thing that you don't have to do, uh, uh, one thing you don't have to use from core content is 2D images. So something we recently added is a image uploader. So you, you can import 2D images. Uh, you can also import NFT images as well, uh, which I'm not going to get into. But um, So we have all these UI textures. So all these 2D images are available for you to use. But you don't have to use these. You can actually import your own by going to the media library. So you can see I have, uh, uh, for example, I have this <laughs> Halo multi-kill sprite sheet. So I, I maybe I can show that off uh, something. Uh, actually, I don't have it on this, uh, this account, I just realized. But something that I've uh, been working on is a Halo multi-kill system. So I had to import all these different images. Um, and now I can actually just like, you know, plop it on the screen. Um, so you can see I just can easily grab something from Google and now it's on my screen. So this is UI. Not going to get into, the, into this really, but uh, you can see it's as easy as that. It's dragging and dropping once you upload it to the media image uploader. So, yep, that is worth mentioning. You can import and this is extremely useful if you want to customize your UI, like create a custom menu, avatar, or, uh, you know, starting screen. Um, all right. OK, 
can you play with a mecha? Yeah, sure, why not? So, at the beginning of this workshop, I, I started this project by creating a, um, a, I used the community project with the mecha assets. And so I have all these uh, mechas for me to play around with. So uh, a cool thing that Commander Fu, uh, one of my coworkers, has made is a kind of a cinematic uh, creation of a mecha. Um, so if you're interested in how this works, uh, you can kind of dive into his example. And he's also going to have a workshop about how he did the cinematic uh, camera movement, stuff like that. So uh, I think that's next Wednesday, if you're interested, uh, the camera workshop. But uh, yeah, essentially what he did, he has like all these camera components that he's using to move the camera up and down. You can see he kind of like saves the camera positions of where uh, where the camera should go. And he has this mecha right here, which is using a script. If we dive into it, there's this build client script, which is kind of moving all the separate parts separately so that it's kind of building it one by one. So you get that cool, like, uh, putting together of a mecha. So a lot of cool stuff uh, that's going on here. Uh, so I don't want to take too much time explaining what's happening there. But, yep, all these mecha uh, art assets are ready for you guys to use. Um, yeah, one thing I didn't actually mention from core content is material. So you can see these are pretty basic white shape, uh, white shade. Um, but if you are interested in actually adding some textures to it and uh, giving it some, so, you know, that uh, mechanical look, uh, you could search for, uh, you could either go through the different material types. Um, so I want something like metally, maybe. Um, so you can see there's all these different types of metals, like car paint. If I just drag it on, you'll notice that it immediately applies to that one object. Uh, but let's say I wanted all these different um uh, like I wanted to just, you know, quickly add this to everything. So what I can do, I think this might work. Uh, might not, but we'll, we'll find out together. If I select everything, let's just click F9. And if I just drag it into here, I don't think this is going to work. Yeah, it's not going to work. So what I have to do instead is I have to select the actual objects that I want to paint inside the hierarchy. And there might be an actual fast way to do it by just searching for Mecca. But you know what? Yeah, it's not going to get every single thing. But, uh, you know, uh, you just have to quickly select all the different objects you want to paint. Ooh, and I just unselected. I just forgot to hold control. So you just quickly do this. Select all the different objects. And then once they're all selected, you can just drag the material onto the mecha itself. You can see, oh, I didn't select everything, but uh, I got most of them, and now all the material is there. So now you have that cool car paint, with ha which has like reflective stuff um, instead of that basic stuff. So yeah, that's essentially how you can start adding different material, is by just uh, searching for it in core content and just dragging it in on top of the thing or you could actually just select it and drag it into the hierarchy or you could select the actual object go to the properties window and then we have different details for so um so this is the knee joint for example so this object actually has multiple slots for material so if i wanted to figure out what slot is what I could just drag into the actual slot here inside the properties window. And you'll see that only one part of it. So that was a bad example because they're really similar. You can see like this object has different slots. So now, now just the inner rings are gold and the outer uh, frame is that car paint uh, detail. So um, yeah, just uh, take note that when you're dragging stuff in, um, it may just fill that one slot and not the entire, all the different slots for that object. But when you do it through the hierarchy and you just drag it into the actual object here, it's going to fill all the slots possible with that material you dragged in. So one slight difference between dragging it into the scene and dragging it into the hierarchy. Um, but if you're, maybe you're not going for this exact car paint, maybe you want it to be a tiny bit more reflective, what you can do is uh, create a custom material. 
And this could be quite useful if you wanted to use this customer tour for all the different car paint. Um, I would highly advise that you use a custom material. That way you don't have to, you know, one by one change each, each color, you know, that would take forever. So instead what I would do is I would, I would create a custom material. And then, uh, when you create a custom material, it goes to your project content, um, or it should. Yeah. So you can see, I have it here. Why is it not popping up? Oh, it's under my materials, not, uh, brushes. So you can see, I have my custom car paint. So what I would do is I would select everything and then I would drag it into the hierarchy. So now every slot is filled with that custom uh, car paint. And then from here, I can just edit this by just double clicking it. And now I can change the color, you know, make it green or whatever. So you can see all the different uh, materials are changing together. So this is a, a much quicker way of changing multiple materials together is create a custom material and then apply it to all the objects that are going to be using that same same material uh, and there's a bunch of different there's a lot more properties that you can change uh, when you're dealing with a custom material you can change like the the glow the the reflectiveness of it um, so yep let me quickly go through stuff play with the pulse rifle does it move like your avatar? Yeah, so you can't actually become a mecha, uh, equip it. That's going to be coming next week. We're going to have a whole new framework project where you can actually equip this to the player. So um, you could figure out how to do it yourself because we have all the different sockets and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I just advise waiting for next week. Um, can you show us where in core content mechaverse assets are? So they're not in uh, core content. They're actually uh, custom templates that we've created for you. So you, the way you do that is you just quickly to repeat what we did in the beginning is we went to community projects and we searched for Mecca. And here it is. So it's a project with all these different assets for you to use. Um, and then from here, you can kind of just copy and paste it to your own project from this uh, example project. Uh, let's see. Yeah, community projects is where you can find them. All right, so I think we're going to end it here because there is a fireside chat uh, happening now, I believe, at 11. So I'm going to stop here.